And I want to cover um, a lot of uh, information. And, but the basic theme is that we have a lot of hope and optimism based on actual results as well as not just wishful thinking, but there's some of that as well. And our major goals at Sloan have been um, not only to cure, um, and, and that includes refractory or relapse disease, uh, so we take a curative approach and are optimistic in, in terms of that. Um, we also like to aim, we're also aiming to minimize side effects, and um, there are obvious examples in terms of, for, for example, our long-standing long policy of no treatment for uh, non-stage 4 uh, MIC and non-amplified uh, neuroblastoma and our discontinuation of transplant some 12 years ago. So we actually have a huge team. I don't want to spend time listing them all, but it's fortunate that at Sloan we have a, a whole practice just to, devoted to neuroblastoma and all these people you see listed are involved um, in, in terms of uh, patients or monitoring data, carrying out laboratory uh, studies just dedicated to neuroblastoma. We have important collaborators at Sloan, uh, for example, in MIBG therapy, Dr. Kramer, uh, Dr. LaCroix in surgery, the uh, person who uh, makes, the antibody, uh, makes our vaccines on, on the premises, and Dr. Suzanne Walden, who's a, a pediatric radiation specialist. These are the um, senior members of our team. And um, just a background in terms of Sloan, we have a huge experience for a single institution because we get referrals because of, mainly because of a lot of, of patients having problems, resistant disease, relapse disease, coming for MIPG therapy and other salvage therapies, tumors that are supposedly unresectable, coming for Dr. Qualia, um, patients that are not eligible for clinical trials elsewhere will turn to us, um, patients who had uh, complications from prior chemotherapy or surgery, again, coming um, to see what we can offer them. We also get referrals especially for um, anti-GD2 antibody partly because we do it outpatient and without interleukin-2, so we have uh, modest toxicity. And there are patients that um, are, come to us because they uh, want to avoid the issues related to transplant. So there are some advantages of being in a single institution. First of all, we have a rapid analysis of results. We um, are able to initiate new and better treatments very, very quickly. Uh, we also have institutional support to do what is best for a patient if we need to deviate from a uh, formal uh, guidelines of a, pro a clinical trial or protocol, our institution usually, um, <coughs> we can count on our institutions to support us based on a good rationale for doing this deviation. Um, all of our uh, services, this is a cancer hospital, and our division, our, de our department, pediatrics, everything is dedicated to children being treated for cancer. So we have expertise of the radiologist specializing in childhood cancer, for example. So our guiding philosophy, as I say, um, is to use as little therapy as possible and avoid toxicity and side effects. We also view that each child is unique. Their case is unique. Their therapy is unique. So we brainstorm about each child as they come through and develop a plan that might be best given the past history of chemotherapy or surgery or did they have MIBG therapy in the past, did they have antibody, uh, and so on. This is just an overview of our approach for us. That's the, uh, we, uh, is pretty generally viewed as uh, allow, uh, can uh, entail uh, spontaneous regression, so it doesn't, uh, we don't usually treat it with anything. Uh, and the same holds actually with surgery. We do not treat, um, we, we set this view, this uh, policy up back in 1988, that if it's not stage four and not high risk from MICAN amplification, we're aiming just to do surgery and observation alone, no chemotherapy, no radiation therapy. And then, of course, the stage four, this, that's, an ongoing, that's the ongoing big, biggest challenge. But as I say, there are a lot of cases that come to us that the recommendation is high-risk therapy or view the disease as high-risk. Here's one that was viewed as high-risk stage three, unresectable, big tumor. Um, this, is a, this is a big tumor here. Um, so what happens was Dr. LaCroix resected this tumor and the child never received any other therapy. The original plan from the primary institution, which is a well-known cancer center, was chemotherapy, transplant, radiation, um, and Accutane. Here's another one. This was um, borderline. In the old days, the, the cutoff uh, age for high risk was 12 months. This was a 15-month-old. The child supposedly had an unresectable tumor. 
and had a big metastasis in the left neck. That's how the, the child was found to have neuroblastoma. We, bio, we actually, Dr. Lequai took out this tumor that was supposedly unresectable, and the biology was favorable. We said no, no treatment at all. So this spontaneously regressed. This child never had any therapy at all, and is, long, is now actually 15 years old. So evaluating each child, whether it's really as high risk or not, is a very big, for us it's extremely important to determine whether or not a child's disease needs therapy at all. So this is an overview of, of what, what we've, what we've uh, our experience at Sloan. And as I say, this sta the, low, the low, low stage and stage 4S, uh, non-amplified with surgical resection, <coughs> watchful observation, and so on. But the big, big issue here, of course, is stage 4, high risk stage 4, I should say. And we carefully define it as being over 18 months of age at diagnosis, so we're making amplification at any, at any age, um, including stage twos and threes. And um, through the years, through the years, we've uh, modified therapy and as we've gone along, and I'll cut, uh, cover some of those. Uh, that's, that's the uh, main gist that I'm going to uh, get to. We have gotten up to the point of, um, of over 60 percent long-term survival of uh, our high-risk patients. I should add that when we first started in an intense way uh, with our neuroblastoma team back in around in the late 80s, 1990, personally, my, own, my, my aim was to cure one child with high-risk neuroblastoma. Dr. Chung had bigger, bigger plans, but mine was to, to cure one. Now we've gotten to the point where if we don't cure a child, we wonder what went wrong with our therapies. That's an amazing advance. So here's an overview of our, what, what Note, uh, main features of our treatment and how we're trying to reduce, um, <coughs> reduce or uh, limit side effects. Chemotherapy. In terms of induction chemotherapy, we used to use seven cycles. We cut it back to five for a variety of reasons, and um, we also discontinued transplant, as I mentioned. So we're, we're dealing with a lot less ototoxicity and a low, much lower risk and practically a vanishing risk of secondary leukemia, which is a well-known complication of extensive chemotherapy. In terms of surgery, Dr. Lequoy, for example, took two years extra um, training to be able to do what's called a thoracal abdominal approach. This gives him a much greater advantage for a complete resection, which we think is a, an advantage in high-risk disease, and less risk of damaging key organs. In terms of radiation therapy, we've always used hyperfraction, meaning twice a day treatments, because at least in laboratory studies, that was less, uh, caused less damage to normal tissues. And lately, we've decreased the dose from 2,100 uh, centigrade to 1,800, again, in an, in an aim to minimize uh, the long-term side effects of radiation therapy. And we were also uh, quick to use what's called proton beam, which is a more precise uh, way of delivering radiation and um, can spare side effects to normal tissues such as the heart um, or spine. Finally, in terms of immunotherapy, we uh, have long, we've only used GMCSF, uh, so we've avoided the toxicity of uh, interleukin-2, and there's a, a lot of rationale for why we think that GMCSF is, is advantageous, not, uh, not only in terms of toxicity, re reducing toxicity, but for uh, augmenting the effectiveness of immunotherapy. And new, we've added vaccine um, after the completion of um, anti-GD2 therapy for all patients in, uh, uh, go, going through this treatment program and after they benefited the maximum from all the standard treatments. We're very pleased that our induction chemotherapy is so effective. On the left, you see somebody with neuroblastoma diagnosis, and virtually the whole body is filled with these dark lines to show neuroblastoma throughout the body. But after the chemotherapy, and um, things have cleared up um, amazingly considering how much there was a diagnosis. So we can re pretty reliably get a good response to our um, high-dose induction chemotherapy. But GD2, the, the anti-GD2 immunotherapy, which was, has been key for maintaining the, the remissions and responses. And Dr. Chung, of course, is the person that um, is, uh, re uh, developed 3FA and has ver developed various other monoclonal antibodies that we use in, in our program for high-risk neuroblastoma. We like 3F8 because we've learned how to handle the side effects so that the treatments are outpatient. Uh, we like 3F8 or anti-GD2 immunotherapy in general because there's no long-term toxicity. We have patients that were treated in the late 80s and uh, now adults. There's no long-term effects, for example, on nerves. You, you kind of get worried about that since anybody can uh, attach to nerve fibers. Um, 
And all the, through, throughout these years, um, we've been carried out a series of studies. As I say, we, get, we get, have a lot of patients. We, we, we uh, analyze results uh, in real time and are very quick to make adjustments or changes uh, and to uh, improve uh, what we think is the best, uh, to make improvements that we think in, in terms of uh, improving the outcome and, and chance of achieving our goal, which is cure and minimal side effects. So we've long used the antibody for consolidating remission, reported on that. Um, um, one of the most gratifying things um, is when you have persistent disease in the bone marrow and then you do antibody therapy and, and you know, from in, in within two weeks you see before the, before the antibody, the bone marrow is still showing neuroblastoma on regular tests. After you do the treatment, you repeat it and it's gone and stays gone. In, in a significant number of patients, it will stay gone. So that's, you know, right in front of your eyes, you're seeing antibody uh, do its thing rather than have it wait 10 years for the results of a randomized study to, to say that it's helpful. So, um, you know, the transplant issue is certainly a big one since we're I, probably the only place uh, in, in that, that doesn't do transplant as a, as a standard of care. Um, and I'll give it a little bit of background. You know, once transplant was considered a, a exciting treatment for a variety of solid tumors, and uh, Donna Lewinsky mentioned the, the, the book, The Emperor of All Maladies. And in that book, they talk about how transplant was such a hot item, including for like breast cancer, until the data started coming out that it really made no difference. So in fact, the um, uh, transplant has, stopped, has dropped out as a, as a useful or a, a recommended treatment for any other solid tumor except for neuroblastoma, which I think is something to keep in mind, except for brain tumors. So no other childhood cancer, rhabdomyosarcoma or human sarcoma, transplant is, is no longer in use. And that holds also for adult tumors. Now, it's transplant is still used because of three randomized studies, and all credit for carrying out randomized studies. But let's take a look at those three randomized studies. We looked at that. There were three of them. One was carried out in the in the early in the early to mid 1980s. I don't know how many years ago that is. It's over 30 years ago. And and the others were carried out in the 1990s. Now, what are they, how relevant are they today? First of all, they did not include key treatments that are now used standard for therapy, uh, standard for high-risk neuroblastoma. One is dose-intensive chemotherapy in starting chemotherapy, starting in a newly diagnosed patient. Radiation therapy was not uniformly used. And of course, immunotherapy wasn't used. So that, that gives you a little bit of a, of, of, a, of a question how relevant the randomized studies were to today's situation. Other drawbacks to those studies, two used little or no therapy in the non-transplant patients. The first used, you know, one eight, uh, transplant versus nothing. You kind of think that the one that got the transplant would have a little advantage in terms of survival. The, um, and the, the, uh, the third, one of the studies, the updated results that were recently reported, showed that there was, in fact, no, no difference in survival in terms of overall survival with very long follow-up. So it kind of undermines the idea that the transplant was, was advantageous. Um, the other thing that's not really mentioned in here is that, of course, the regimens that you use for transplant were different in all the different studies. And so people talk about transplant, quote unquote, but it's like talking about chemotherapy, quote unquote. There's, you have to know what the chemotherapy was. You have to know what the transplant regimen was. And just for example, in the third study that showed no survival in the long term, the, the regimen used total body radiation, which of course no one uses anymore because of excessive toxicity. So we had some, in, in, our, in, our, in our team, we had some uh, uncertainties about the advisability of continuing transplant. Then the, also, more theoretically, if you want to put it that way, is that there was a, we kind of thought there would be a low likelihood that the agents used in transplant could ablate neuroblastoma that survived exposure during induction chemotherapy to, to very strong uh, doses or high doses of chemotherapy that act the same way as the agents that we use in the transplant. And in fact, we kind of thought that the results of the recent children's oncology group trial showing that purging of the stem cells made no difference, suggesting that if someone relapsed after transplant, it's not because the, 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 trans, the, 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 uh, the stem cells that were gave back had neuroblastoma in them, but that the myeloablative regimen, that the chemotherapy regimen of the transplant was not enough to kill the neuroblastoma that was still in the child. And then, of course, as I said, we evaluate our experience all the time. 
And through from 1990 on, there were various periods where we did not use transplant and where we did use transplant. And we, were, we went back and looked over that situation very carefully. And we, we saw no advantage to, during, uh, with survival or outcome during the periods when we were doing transplant. So basically the idea was that transplant had not improved survival, at least in our large um, in-house experience, which we uh, can analyze very carefully because we knew each patient so well and, and their story and, and had the data right in front of us and with large numbers. And again, our overall view be, aim being to do what's best for a child to achieve cure and try to minimize side effects. And I should say that we were involved in, uh, also very excited about the use of transplant when we first started back in the, the late, eight, back in the 1980s and into the 90s. And, we were one of the first groups to use a uh, regimen that did not use total body radiation. And we actually carried out, a, a looked, at, looked at the transplant I a issue in our center because, as I say, since 2003, we did not transplant our own patients, but patients could be referred to us for antibody after they had any kind of therapy, including transplant. So from, for, since then, all the patients in complete remission that come to our center, whether they're transplanted or uh, got into chemotherapy, got into remission without transplant, were treated the exact same way for, to consolidate their remission. And in this large experience, we um, found that, um, that there was no significant difference. In fact, overall survival was I identical. So it sort of uh, re reinforced um, our commitment. I still remember the first time we decided on a patient not to do the transplant. I was a little nervous about it. Um, but uh, as, the, as years have gone by, I think, um, at least in our, in our own team, and our own experience, we're um, uh, extremely pleased to be avoiding the issues of transplant. And now, in terms of the antibodies that we do in-house, we, we've developed a lot of treatments that uh, are developed in, within our, in a, at our center or, um, and uh, mainly under the supervision of Dr. Chung. And it's a huge... I, I don't know how this gentleman carries out all that he does. And one of the issues is getting... Uh, uh, Agents made, purified, approved by the by the uh, Food and Drug Administration, uh, and and uh, carrying out through. You've heard some of the difficulties of, of regulatory issues, but fortunately things are a lot are very streamlined at our center, um, and um, under Dr. Super, uh, Dr. Chung's supervision. So one of the big advances that we've had is the develop the three F eight is being the antibody we've used forever and ever. Uh, it, was a, it came from a mouse originally, but there's some downsides to having a mouse antibody. And uh, Dr. Chung again undertook the project of uh, humanizing it. And that came with uh, funds from uh, numerous foundations that uh, could, could support all this. And just very quickly, um, and we have more extensive studies in the laboratory, in the laboratory that the humanized had uh, multiple advantages um, over, the, um, over, the, um, sorry, over the mouse form. Um, for example, working with um, uh, white blood cells, it, would, uh, it, it was much better at killing um, neuroblastoma. And, um, and the effect of, um, uh, an, an effect that involves another part of the immune system called complement um, was less. And that was actually nice because it's thought that that activity is what increases the main side effect of pain. So we're hoping, based on the laboratory findings, that the humanized would be much better at killing neuroblastoma and have much fewer side effects, meaning uh, the pain side effect. And we actually compared it to uh, other antibodies that are in use, including CH14.18 and others. And again, the advantages of these two antibodies uh, was evident in um, our laboratory studies. So that's why we have stuck with using, uh, continued uh, uh, using the Murray, the mouse, and uh, gradually now we're phasing in the use of the uh, humanized 3F8. Of course, there are lots of ways of attack, of, of exploiting the immune system. Um, people have, uh, in, in this meeting yesterday today have talked um, about them. Uh, we we um, are, are um, particularly engaged in use of, um, just can't get this, of um, yeah, the bispecific antibodies is our, is our next big player. Uh, Dr. Chung developed this one. And again, and in the laboratory uh, models, it showed uh, dramatic efficacy, activity, um, effectiveness against um, even so, uh, soft tissue tumors, which is something that's been a, a weakness of immunotherapy up until now, and we hope have high hopes about that. We'll be starting that in the clinic uh, within the next um, several months. But um, we're, uh, um, we have to deal with treatment failure. And, um, 
And um, as I say, we're um, re refractory disease. Um, I'm sorry, actually, all the slides not coming up. I don't know why. But anyway, um, the refractory refers to an incomplete response to induction chemotherapy. And we've showed that, um, that a um, <coughs> that the use of 3F8 is often very effective against that. I'm, again, I'm sorry the slide is being missed. But we, re we reported on how uh, many times uh, refractory disease responds uh, to uh, uh, immunotherapy and that it can lead to long-term cure. But we take a, uh, okay, so just here's an example, for example, uh, of, a of a complete response to the humanized 3F8. On the left, you see a very abnormal MIBG scan uh, before the therapy. Um, and um, again, the dark spots in the bones. Okay, so these dark spots in the bones represent disease. Show arms, arms, and then, you know, after the an humanized antibody, it's complete normalization of the MIBG scan. Here's another one. Here's a child who, um, again, had MIBG therapy, chemotherapy, had persistence of disease throughout the skeletal structures, had positive, you know, extensively involved bone marrow. Got, anti got the humanized antibody and has achieved a complete remission. Cleared the marrow, cleared the, cleared the MIBG scan. So relapse is another treatment failure with high-risk neuroblastoma. So it's a new disease occurring after somebody's been in complete remission. And we've reported that um, our approach, uh, I should mention that for refractory as well as for, for treatment failure, relapse, I should say, for re refractory disease on the prior slides, relapse on this one, for each child, we, again, brainstorm about what their situation is. Where's the real, if it's refractory, um, how refractory it is. What was the prior therapy? What's the child's condition now? What treatments could we use in the best way, the different options put together for a treatment plan that could improve the, uh, gain a complete remission? For relapse, it's the same issue. Was it an early relapse? Was it a relapse a long time off therapy? What kind of therapy had they had before? What is their condition now? What can they tolerate in terms of a retrieval. How extensive was the relapse? But the aim is we're aiming to cure these, these situations. So we monitor our patients very closely. And if we find, the aim is to find a relapse that is really just, just happening. Um, you can see the arrows on this slide showing the site of relapse. So we've, um, we take, um, we try very hard to monitor our patients very closely. So indeed, if they are going to relapse, we'll catch it early. Because our view is that if you do that, you have a much better chance of retrieving, re-salvaging, curing that, that situation. Here's another example. These are, these are two uh, different children. And um, the relapse was, it doesn't come across that well in this, but there was a, a relapse in the femur here, in the, in the thigh bone there. And here was a small relapse, a relapse in one of the vertebral bodies, one of the backbones. So we, we caught these, these relapses very early, and we were able to um, salvage, you know, save, save that child. Here's a child that had, um, it was a very uh, remarkable thing, because the relapse was a tumor in the, an area that we didn't, wouldn't have expected relapse. And in fact, on MIBG scan, this was clear. And urine markers were normal. The only thing that showed the relapse was the CT scan. The only thing that showed the relapse was the CT scan. So Dr. LeCoy took out this tumor. We administered chemotherapy and antibody to consolidate the remission. And this became, this child is a long-term survivor. And that was a mechanamplified relapse, in fact. Then we had the problem of relapse in the brain. <clears throat> This is a uh, problem that's becoming an increasingly commonly detected one as patients, maybe because they're surviving longer, and these, it gives these things time to develop. And up until about 2003, in our experience, no child survived. Whatever we tried didn't work. And about the, at that time, we developed a, a, a treatment plan involving surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and use of a monoclonal antibody. Um, and the results have been dramatically different. Many of these relapses, by the way, in the brain are asymptomatic. So we, we are very careful to monitor our patients uh, as part of the workup if they have some risk factors. For example, if they had a spinal tap at diagnosis or if they have mic amplified tumor, at every workup, every three months, no longer than that between um, studies, we include a head MRI. 
So the salvage options, as I say, just to summarize a little bit, is personalized program for each patient. And we use various chemotherapy regimens as a start, if, uh, depending on what, what they've had in the past and uh, various other considerations. We use targeted, radi targeted therapy, meaning uh, targeted radiation therapy, MIB geotherapy, which delivers radiation to uh, tumors throughout the body. We actually routinely follow that with a big hit of chemotherapy before we give back to stem cells, which are always pretty routinely used after MIBG therapy. We also have used antibody with radio -labeled, that are radio-labeled with um, radioactive iodine. Again, it's another way to deliver radiation therapy to multiple sites in the body. <coughs> and for the brain tumors, we actually infuse another monoclonal antibody that, doc that Dr. Chung developed called 8H9 as a way to target radiation therapy to uh, the, C the central nervous system, which otherwise is protected from um, treatments that go into the bloodstream. In terms of antibody, we are, um, once we, um, we like to incorporate the use of immunotherapy into our salvage programs, whether or not they received um, antibodies in the past, whether they received our antibodies in the past or other antibodies. Uh, be, for, and we use it with GMCSF, as I say, which increases the effectiveness in, uh, in, in our studies. We've shown that, and along with, or with NK cells, which is another exciting uh, immunotherapy pro program that, we use, that we've been using now. Uh, in conjunction with monoclonal antibodies. And then the, the, the newest, you know, one of the newest things that has been talked about in terms of genetic mutations and so on, we're, um, we have a very aggressive uh, approach to um, evaluating tumor specimens from our patients as they go through treatment, uh, looking for new mutations that potentially could be uh, uh, targets of um, medications that otherwise we wouldn't have thought about using for our, our, our patients and are not usually thought of as, using, as being um, that useful for neuroblastoma. This is just a quick slide that, about the in-house in um, system that we use. I just would just emphasize that we're very uh, quick to incorporate these, any new agents that uh, we didn't expect to use, we are quick to incorporate those in our treatment programs to, again, enhance the possibility of a cure for a child. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on our salvage regimens. We have developed various chemotherapy salvage regimens uh, to uh, handle or try to minimize the issues of resistant or relapsed uh, neuroblastoma. And again, we, we choose based on um, prior therapy that a patient might have and what they might be able to uh, tolerate. Here's an example of the 3F8 being radio-labeled as, as a treatment and um, a child who had extensive MIBG, you know, MIBG positive disease. Um, got treated, couldn't get MIBG therapy for various reasons, got treated by 3F8 and had achieved a complete remission, has become a long-term survivor. We do use MIBG therapy. I don't want to spend too, you know, time on that. It's, it's widely used uh, for good reasons. We are very, maybe, um, uh, we're very happy to be able to use that when there's refractory disease. I should say we're, we're also happy that we've shown that it can be actually administered in a regular room with um, just a lead shield be between the child and, and the parents or other people in the room um, without exposing people and um, other people on the regular pediatric oncology floor to uh, excessive radiation. But we're very happy to use uh, MIBG therapy. It's really helped many of our patients like this one. Now, the, the um, targeted radiation therapy um, using um, antibody is, as I mentioned, is, is, is very um, important in our treatment for these relapses in the brain. You can see this big, big mass. Um, as I say, up until we started using this program, everybody, it was, it was a death sentence, uh, having this kind of a relapse. And since we've um, incorporated our uh, various, our, our treatment, uh, salvage treatment program, uh, we, we really are curing large numbers of these children, which is uh, really a, a, a beautiful um, improvement or advance in therapy. Again, here's two other examples of patients who had major CNS relapses and um, how things are years later. Now, um, so I'll, I'll um, I think this is, I'm getting towards the end, and this is our, our um, vaccine um, program that we first were using for patients in second remission or later um, because of, we started off with a phase one study. Um, this, um, this vaccine includes two components that are on neuroblastoma um, cells, uh, GD2 and GD3. So the idea is to induce the child to make their own antibodies against these <coughs> markers 
and keep uh, and so that, that if there are neuroblastoma cells still lurking in the patient, that might not have been eradicated by the treatments um, of uh, chemotherapy, radiation, um, other kinds of immunotherapy, that, that they would be able to um, uh, ablate those, um, those uh, hidden neuroblastoma cells in the, in the, in the child. So, um, and the, the treatment is um, the, the, um, in the antibody, I mean in the vaccine, we also not only include these two markers, but several agents that stimulate the immune system to respond to things that are being injected there. And that is, a, um, this vaccine is, is made um, in special laboratory at Sloan Kettering that's dedicated to developing vaccines and uh, <laughs> constructing vaccines uh, for children, for anybody with cancer, including um, our neuroblastoma patient population. And we've also used um, an agent called beta-glucan which is a naturally occurring substance that, in, that had a long sort of um, informal history of being in, 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 uh, something that augments and strengthens the immune system. And um, we took it seriously enough to say, let's examine the issue. And Dr. Modak and Dr. Chung carried out a series of experiments in the laboratory setting um, to, to assess whether this had any validity, any, had any uh, potential as a treatment, and it did really show that it improved the effectiveness of antibodies in killing neuroblastoma and some other tumors as well. So we've, and it's a very easily uh, taken agent, it's taken by mouth. Um, so and when we designed the, the vaccine protocol, treatment program, we start off with, with um, three injections within the first two or so weeks. And about six weeks later, after the, the sort of a time frame to, for a child to develop um, antibodies, hopefully against the GD2 and GD3, then we start, uh, then the child starts taking the glucan, which is two weeks on, two weeks off. As I say, it's a very easy kind of um, additional uh, treatment, if you want to put it that way. Um, and then the, the booster shots are given periodically up to a year. And of course, during this period, we're monitoring for um, evidence of not only immune response, but just to make sure the children are, are staying in, in remission. As I say, we, we did this first in children's second or, or later remissions because we didn't know about side effects. Um, and uh, given the uh, very poor uh, prediction for outcome uh, with, uh, for someone who had already relapsed once or twice or more, um, if, if we felt it was okay to uh, treat those, those children with something that could have unforeseen side effects. Um, fortunately, it did not have unforeseen side effects. It was very well tolerated. It does hurt when you do the injection, um, and there's sometimes a, a major local reaction. Um, but um, it's uh, it, it you know we we never had to discontinue the shots because of uh, side effects. And actually, our preliminary results were very encouraging, and um, and we this is these were actually our preliminary results. Um, we went on to expand our. Um, pay, number of patients that were treated with the vaccine in second remission. Results still were encouraging, lack of side effects. So now we, we've moved it up to our frontline therapy. So our children get chemotherapy, they get the radiation, surgery, radiation, antibody, and when they're done with their standard therapy for uh, our standard therapy uh, up till now, uh, we uh, um, add in the vaccine. And we've been doing, that's been um, going for about the last half a year um, and counting. So um, I'm very glad that we can add something that might improve further, um, might improve further the um, uh, cure rates of, of, these, of children. Um, and then um, just a summary. Um, again, um, we're aiming for cure. There are a lot of factors that we're bringing into play that we think can improve. Uh, Cure with less toxicity, fewer late side effects, including, for example, secondary leukemia, which can, is a, is a, was, has been a major problem in, in past studies. Um, historically, relapse was deemed to be invariably fatal or always going to lead to death, and we're really trying to show that that's not the case, and that's certainly not our approach. Um, we think that uh, comprehensive surveillance when someone's in complete remission is really worth doing. Um, at Sloan, we're able to carry these studies out within two days. Um, outpatient, uh, we have an anesthesiologist every, uh, every day of the week, so we can carry out extensive bone marrow tests, and MIBG is available every day. We carry out 10 or more of those studies per week. Um, 
course, novel therapies, the humanized antibody is uh, one that you know, came to the clinic within uh, two or three years after being developed and is um, rapidly, um, uh, our accrual has been so great that, and findings have been so encouraging that we're um, set to replace the, uh, moving into our frontline therapy um, because of um, being able to hit high, very high doses with much uh, less toxicity. And of course, um, the uh, overall survival has improved uh, dramatically because now if there's a relapse in the brain, we're able to uh, offer a real good chance for uh, cure.